Hello everyone, I'm Steven and you're watching Steven Love Science. And today we're at Life Technologies headquarters in Carlsbad, California, where our cameras have been allowed to enter their ion torrent laboratory, where scientists and engineers are constantly striving to improve the way we sequence DNA. So before we enter the lab, let's learn a little bit about the ion torrent and semiconductor sequencing technology. Ion torrent technology takes an entirely new approach to sequencing DNA, making the process faster, easier, and more affordable than ever before. Unlike previous methods of sequencing, ion torrent works using a semiconductor chip. This chip is similar to the one that is in your camera. However, instead of being covered by millions of pixels, the ion torrent semiconductor chip is covered by millions of wells. Sequencing can begin after a piece of DNA is broken up into millions of different fragments. These fragments are then amplified millions of times over until they coat their own individual bead. These beads then flow over the semiconductor chip, each one becoming deposited in its own well. Sequencing can begin after one of the four DNA bases flows over the semiconductor chip. Whenever a DNA base is incorporated into a strand of DNA, a hydrogen ion is released. For example, the incorporation of guanine into this DNA strand causes the release of a hydrogen ion. This is how semiconductor sequencing works, by measuring that chemical change directly on the chip. Whenever a hydrogen ion is released, a change in pH occurs. An ion-sensitive layer directly underneath the well detects that change in pH and converts it into voltage. That voltage change is then measured and recorded, indicating whether or not a nucleotide was incorporated. For example, let's say the base thymine was covering this well. In that case, Thymine would not be incorporated into the DNA strand since it is not complementary to since it's not complementary to cytosine, no hydrogen ion would be released, and no change in voltage would be recorded, indicating that the, the indicating that the base was not incorporated into the DNA strand. This is exactly how semiconductor sequencing works at ion torrent. Alright, so now that we understand the basic principles by which semiconductor sequencing functions, I think we're ready to head into the lab. Joining us today will be Dr. Rob Bennett. Vice President of Research and Development here at Ion Torrent. Be a teen chip. Um, this is just a seven gig. It's just like the type of chip that's in your phone, except instead of detecting photons, like when we take our picture, right, it detects photons this way. So it's so on the 318 chip, you know, that little football area, we have about 1.2 um, 1.2 million wells in there. So there's some tiny little wells in there. But if you get it, take a bead that has DNA on there, actually insert them into each of those individual wells and then sequence them within the well. So every time a nucleotide is incorporated into the growing DNA strand, protons are released, we detect a pH change, and we know the nucleotide has been incorporated. And we just do that, you know, literally millions of times on the chip, and that's how we assemble the sequence. So instead of um, like a chip in your, like in this camera that's recording video, we have millions of pixels, on this chip we have millions of wells. And those wells are just going to receive a fragment of DNA, and that DNA we're going to be able to detect whether or not a proton is released during the incorporation of the nucleotide. Exactly, yeah. And I'm sorry, I misspoke. This actually just has 12 million wells. 12 million. That's a lot of wells. 12 million wells. So, so this um, runs, this is the first one of the first chips we launched, runs on what we call the personal genome machine. So that's this machine here. Uh, I'm sure Just a quick question. Yeah. What is like the diameter of each well? Uh, the diameter of each well is around uh, in the microns. Right. Yeah. So how do you manufacture the wells? So, yeah. So, small. so we actually use the same type of uh, manufacturing uh, boundaries that make semiconductor chips, basically, and then we just um, work with them to actually etch the wells into this the same semiconductor chip again that's in our phones, and then we put this flow cell on top so we can flow liquid across. And then you have the um, sensor that's going to measure the the pH. Is that they're all underneath all each, oh, they're all, you can't really see them here, but they're all underneath each well. This is called an ISFET, and that's actually what yeah, detects the, the, pH, the pH change, turns into a charge, a change of charge, and that's what we detect. So, so basically you're breaking the DNA from the fragments, so how does the fragmentation of DNA work? Is that just with a restriction enzyme? Or? Um, either you can use sonication, you can use sound to break the DNA and fragment the DNA, or it's also enzymes. So we don't use restriction enzymes. We use enzymes that don't have any base specificity. Oh. Right, so like a general nuclease, like kind of like DNA one. So it's a different version of that. Okay. So what is the read like and what are the wells? Yeah, so well, we started at 100, uh, 100 nucleotides, 100 base pairs, and now we're up to 400 base pairs. We just want to get to 400 base pairs, and then internally in R&D we're doing up to 600 base pairs now. We're very excited. So 
I have, I have a question. Like, when you're fragmenting the DNA, what happens if a piece of DNA that's not primed Um, well, a lot of the, there's a lot of crosstalk, a lot of different DNA molecules. So, oh, just sorry. Right, so it's critical that each well has multiple copies of the same DNA fragment. So the question you're asking is, if they're mixed up, what happens? There we can, there were basically sequencing two types of sequences at once, and we, we don't, we're not able to sequence that happens. So we spent a lot of time in the template prep to ensure that it's a single bead per well, and each of those beads represents a single copy of DNA. So do, how do you get to the same copy of DNA on other beads? Then we do that with something called flow PCR, so we have the instrument. Oh, so you use PCR. That's we use an PCR. Yeah. So, but do you do the PCR after the fragmentation? Because it's like, then you have a double strand of sure. yeah, yeah, so we take the genomic DNA, we fragment that using enzymes, right? And then we actually have to uh, ligate on two pieces of DNA sequences onto the ends. We use those to PCR amplify the DNA onto the bead, and then we load, and then we physically load the beads onto the bead. But but how do you um, how do you you have a, you're doing the polymerization of it of the DNA in the chip, but after you do PCR, is it going to be double stranded? It, it is. So so after you do the PCR onto the bead, then you, you use the NOH and denature it, the single oh, strand DNA. Yep. So that's yeah, so the beads, that's exactly right. The beads are loaded on the on the well have a single strand of copy of DNA. We have a sequencing primer to that, and that's how we that, that's what starts the elimination the, the sequencing reaction itself. Do you ever get like unwanted dimers forming or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Of course, but you know that's that's a lot of the work my team does is to understand how to, you know, do the sample prep to avoid primer dimers, adapter dimers, multiple templates on a single bead. And that's the work we do here. So we're using standard DNA polymerase on the chip? We do. We use a standard DNA polymerase. This is proprietary to life. So no like dime. modified polymerase or anything? It's a modified polymerase. Oh, there okay. is. But this is really what makes the ion technology so great opposed to previous previously used fluorescent technology in which you're using a modified nucleotide that has some sort of fluorescent component attached to it. Because another thing is, is the homopolymer accuracy is much much higher on ion technology than Well, it's one of the, it's one of the, uh, it, it's always improving. Um, the way the way we sequence homopolymers can sometimes be an issue, but we really solve that now with both software and molecular biology approaches. We can really, you know, improve that, that part of the sequence. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the key things about ion technology is it's the speed, the simplicity, and, um, <clears throat> You know, the speed of that, it takes about four hours to actually do an ion sequencing uh, run, where there can other other technology that use fluorescent dyes, like you're talking about, it takes a week. So that's the key thing. So again, the simplicity that, you know, no modified nucleotides, um, so that, that's really the key of the ion. Technology. So you're really taking advantage of the life process that's evolved? Over, over sure. Oh, yeah. So that's that's the uh, the 318 chip, yeah, that's both of them. So we also have we just released the Proton 1 chip. This has 160 million wells. Okay. So it's about tenfold more wells than, than the, the 318 chip. So this really allows us to sequence up to you know, 12, 12 gigabytes, 12 billion bases in about a four hour runtime. This only gives you about, about one, one gig for one billion bases. Can we take a look at the actual personal genome machine? Sure, of course. We'll try another time. First sequencing the instruments that actually will sit on a bench like this really allows every lab to have access to an instrument like this. Um, it's, it's very simple. Um, you would add, there's four nucleotides that people use to sequence, uh, GTP, CTP, ATP, and TTP. So you know, you'd attach those, uh, um, you know, we have, well, maybe we should go to one that's... See here you have one, so you have the four nucleotides down here, so there's no and then you have wash buffers here. And then um, the way you load the chip is, is very simple. Right? So you, you you've taken you're taking your loaded chip with the beads on there and simply opening up the gasket there. Right? And then 
then you simply um, you know, place it right in there and just close it down. Attach your buffers, and you're just, and you're just ready to go. And then about a two hour run, you get about, again, you get about one million bases in sequence out of a run, about a four hour run. So you're constantly um, switching the, what do you call it, switching, but the nucleotide that is covering the wells, right? That's right. So how do you. We run them sequentially over. So A, A then you wash off of the A, uh, C, wash, T, wash, G, wash. So, uh, how do you guarantee that, like, the beat isn't going to come out during the washing process? Or um, the they don't. It's just the physics of the beads. And there it has, the, the beat is obviously coated with DNA, so there's a lot of electrostatic forces that keep the beads in the water. So, once you get um, a hydrogen ion released and you've confirmed that you've added that nucleotide to the strand, um, like, what is the feedback mechanism, mechanism in which, like, it's, it's really to the device? How does it all come together? Like, That's right. So yeah, underneath each well, there's a sensor that detects the incorporation of the nucleotide again by a pH change, and then it's just it's just the sequence of the nucleotides that are flowed over there, and then we reconstruct the DNA sequence. So it must be pretty complicated software. Like, um, software is complicated. It, it's a you know it, it is definitely it's a system where it brings together all kinds of different disciplines in science, right? There's obviously the microbiology piece that, you know, I'm most familiar with. But yeah, there's the uh, chip architecture, software, you know, it's a real system. So it takes a lot of different disciplines to come together to put together a system like this. What about the mid-eye? Do you have one of those here? No, that's not a light technology. Oh, that's not a light technology. Oh, that's not a light technology. <laughs> No. It's, it's, it's an Oxford, Oxford, Oxford nanopore. Oxford nanopore. Oops, okay, um, that out. Yeah, that's okay. Um, not very many people, if anybody has one of those. <laughs> <laughs> but just in all seriousness, yeah. Like, but that's a nanopore. Anyway, that's a nanopore instrument, so that's a little different. Is that superior to this method? Or, I mean, is this commercial machine and semiconductor sequence superior to the nanopore? Absolutely. In terms of accuracy, throughput, it far, far exceeds anything you can do with the nanopore sequencing technology today. Really, nano, nanopore technology really is something farther off in the future. It's still years away. Yeah. So this, this does not have the computing system incorporated? That's right, it does not. Now, um, normally, we have, all, we have a, a very large server farm where all of our data from all these instruments are going. A, a, a customer typically will have one or two and have a single server for one or two PGMs. So you have the ion torrent technology right now. What's the next step in developing it? What are, what are, what are you what Sure, are well the next step was, um, was this one, the proton. Yeah. So we go look at the proton instrument. It's very similar. All right. All right. Anything else? Anything, anything else? Anything else? No? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we've just completed our tour of the Life Technologies Carlsbad facility. Sorry you didn't get to get the full spectrum, only in the Ion Torrent Lab. We went, we went a lot of places after that. Sorry you couldn't come with us, but I got to see it. So, really great company here. They're doing great things to improve the quality that's the quality of work that scientists can produce and ultimately improve improve the quality of life. Thanks for watching this episode of Stephen Love Science. There's just three weeks left till the conference deadline. My next postdoc and funding's on the line. I just got off a call with a great opportunity. They rate my work so much. Like we're going